get, get this started. Uh, so before we begin, I would like to make a real quick apology. Um, last month, under combination of uh, myriad of internet issues and uh, grad school uh, midterms, I forgot to download the Zoom recording for the October meeting before it was deleted by Zoom automatically. Um, so I, I do apologize for that. That was a mistake on my part. I also didn't know that our Zoom auto-deleted things after only seven days. Uh, so lesson learned there. With that out of the way, uh, welcome uh, to the monthly meeting of Tucson Amateur Astronomy's Fundamentals Group. Um, just to avoid the acronym soup that goes along with that. Uh, tonight, we will Sick. follow along with uh, our usual format of two presentations. Pete Hermes will start us off with our with um, an astronomer of the month on Cecilia Payne Kapishkin. And I'm hoping I am pronouncing that last name mostly correctly. Kapishkin, yeah, Kap uh, yes, Kapishkin. Yeah, definitely, I, I, definitely I could see it either way, depending on regional yeah. accents. You know, there's always so I'm going to go with Kapashkin tonight. So okay. And um, after that, we, Doug Smith will be presenting on volcanism in the solar system, which is a topic Ooh. that has not come across mm. us before. Uh, for next month, I will be trying to present a main topic on galaxy classifications, assuming I can escape certain things in grad school, uh, which seems hopeful at this point. Uh, so did you look forward to at least uh, one of those presentations? I don't know if we will have another at the moment. We'll figure that out as we go. And with that, Pete, we will start. Take it away. Very good. Thank you, Connor. Thank you, group. As usual, always a pleasure and honor to present before you. Uh, tonight, I'll be speaking about Cecilia Payne Kapashkin. Uh, she was born Cecilia Payne, uh, was her maiden name. Kapashkin was the gentleman that she married uh, back in the 30s. Uh, but as usual, and I've been doing, you know, for those of you that are new, uh, those of you that have been here know this, uh, but for those of you that are new, uh, I've been presenting on quite a few astronomers over the past 12 months, not every month. Uh, but, you know, going back all the way back to Ptolemy, uh, covering some, uh, you know, mid first millennia, uh, astronomers and Doug did uh, some of the other ones, especially from the uh, uh, Eastern Asia. And then doing some of the uh, Arabic or Islamic uh, astronomers, then moving into modern times. I always find it kind of fascinating. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks or a couple of meetings ago, I presented on uh, uh, Edmund Hawley and, you know, always Haley. And I always thought the only thing he was known for was the comet found out a bit more. Well, in this case, uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Kapashkin, and this was a completely new area. I, know, I, I was not familiar with the name before. I suggested it to Connor, and the main reason was, uh, believe it or not, she is probably one of the most preeminent astronomers uh, from the 20th century, and yet I'd never heard her name. Uh, that's you know that's just my failing. She's actually out there. I know people in the industry have probably heard of her. Doug, have you heard of her before? Yes. Okay, so Doug's a little bit familiar, and I would expect anybody that's in the industry, amateur, professional, or a little more knowledgeable, probably has. But this was a this was a new individual to me. But anyhow, um, Cecilia was you know an astronomer and astrophysicist, uh, much associated with Harvard, as you'll come to see in my presentation. And as usual, I'll cover a little bit about her life, her personal life, education, work, legacy, and then the references, of course. Uh, I believe this picture here is uh, when she was uh, probably mid-career at Harvard. She spent most of her, in fact, all of her professional career at Harvard, uh, academically, and both at the, at the Harvard, uh, Harvard Observatory. Uh, she was born uh, the first year of the previous century First, first, yeah, first year of the previous century, May 10th, uh, Cecilia Helena Payne uh, in, Wend in Wendover, Buckinghamshire, England. Uh, she had two siblings who were younger, Humphrey and Leonora, uh, both and probably just a couple, two to three, four years younger, I suspect. Uh, they were fairly close in age. Uh, her parents were Edward John Payne and Emma Leonora Helena Paris. Uh, Edward John Payne was a, he was a lawyer. He was a barrister in England, quite accomplished. Uh, he was a bit of a polymath, uh, not so much in the sciences, but in other areas. 
Uh, he was a musician, although not a professional musician, probably everything short of. Uh, he was the organist at uh, his church. He was the regular organist. Unfortunately, one of the things in the development, other than this event occurring, uh, Cecilia had a pretty good family life. Uh, she was well taken care of, well educated. Uh, but unfortunately, her father died when she was only four years old. And then the mother was responsible for raising the family. I suspect they were probably more than capable. They did not necessarily come upon hard times, other than the fact I'm sure this was a traumatic and a uh, very sad event for the family. Uh, but her mother, Emma, came from a distinguished Prussian family. Uh, one thing, too, and I think uh, I'm not really going to dwell on it too much, but both uh, both of uh, Cecilia's uh, siblings, Humphrey and Leonora, were quite accomplished in adult life. Uh, maybe not as much as she was, uh, and but they certainly attained about the same level of fame, which was virtually little and this will come with explanation as we go through her life a little bit um a couple of key factors she gained uh, u.s citizenship in 1931 this was following uh completion basically of her first level of college let's say uh and there's a reason for this and i'll cover this and later when we talk about her education uh in 1933 when she was 33 she was on tour in europe as an astronomer and that's where she met uh, sergey kapashkin uh, she didn't meet Sergei in Russia. Uh, interestingly enough, she met him in uh, uh, Germany. I suspect he was uh, he was probably exiled or he had to leave Russia. But anyhow, uh, they developed a relationship and within a year were married to the United States after she had helped uh, Sergei secure a visa to come to the United States. And then, of course, we come to the end, you know, December 7th, uh, she lived you know, uh, over 79 years, which was uh, pretty good. Uh, she died at her home in Cambridge. You can see two pictures here. Uh, one doesn't show, uh, shows uh, on the right, shows her husband. Uh, this was taken in 40, 1946, and two of her children. Uh, I'm trying to remember, there was, yeah, Edward and Catherine. There is one other, oh, there it is, Peter, uh, who is not who is not pictured. I don't know why. Uh, but this was taken in 46. I suspect Peter was around. He just wasn't in this picture. And then, of course, a much later one, uh, the same year uh, that Cecilia died. That's her and her husband. I believe they are at a conference, and I'm trying to, in Mexico City. It was an astronomy conference. Uh, it was the American Astronomy Association. Uh, you know, surprisingly, and for some reason, the conference was in Mexico City. Uh, but that, that's where that picture came from. Uh, as far as her education, she had to, uh, this was, uh, you know, initially she started out attending private school in Wendover. Uh, later on, uh, once uh, after her father had passed, uh, and a few years later, her mother uh, saw fit to move the family. Uh, she, she was, you know, the sole support for them. But she ended up enrolling in St. Mary's College, which was an all-girls school. Uh, by the time she was 18, in 1918, she changed to St. Paul's Girls School. Uh, she was urged to study music somewhat in the footsteps of her father, like I say, even though he may not have, he was basically a borderline professional musician, uh, he was a very accomplished musician at that. Uh, I suspect that's one of the reasons she was encouraged to study mu uh, music. However, uh, at some point, uh, and not, not so much astronomy, but uh, Cecilia was more interested in science. I think there was uh, something in her uh, character uh, that developed at an early age, either before school or during school, where she became interested in research specifically. And I think that's why she may have been drawn to science. Uh, in 1919, she won a scholarship, a full ride, to Newham College, Cambridge University, ostensibly to study botany, physics, and chemistry. Uh, after her first year, she ended up dropping botany to focus more so on physics and chemistry, which is explains a lot. Uh, as far as her development into becoming a professional astronomer. Uh, we find that her astronomy interests were much elevated, uh, probably created, developed, and significantly nurtured in a very short time uh, after she attended a lecture by Arthur Eddington uh, related to his 1919 uh, expedition to Principe. Uh, he, along with, and I, can't, I think it was Russell, was the other astronomer, uh, they went to... Do, uh, two locations basically to observe the eclipse. Uh, one of the main reasons was to uh, observe the eclipse so that they could try to validate uh, Einstein's theory of relativity with respect to the sun 
uh, actually uh, bending some of the light of nearby stars because the only time you could see nearby stars close to the sun was during an eclipse. And that was the you know, primary purpose of these expeditions uh, to be positioned uh, at totality and to make these observations and see uh, the slight positional changes uh, in the stars uh, just outside the, uh, basically right along the eclipse. Uh, but this is what really developed her interest specifically in astronomy. And later on, we'll see Eddington did have uh, uh, probably some influence and effect on her initial career, most assuredly her academic career. Uh, Eddington was, you know, from the UK. I think I talked about him a few months ago. Uh, but uh, of course, he was a well-accomplished and well-known astronomer uh, in the UK, among others. Uh, she completed her uh, studies, but was not awarded a degree uh, here at Cambridge, and this is in the U.S. Uh, Cambridge did not grant women degrees until 1948. Uh, best option, uh, I'm, no, I'm sorry, back up. This is not Cambridge in the U.S., Cambridge in the U.K. Um, after she uh, completed her studies, she, you know, like I say, didn't have a degree, uh, but she figured and pretty much was advised that her best option was to become a teacher in, UK, in the UK, in England. In other words, she wouldn't necessarily be accepted to continue uh, studies, research, or any work in astronomy. So uh, Cecilia decided to look outside of the UK and England and took a look at the United States following an introduction that she had with Harlow Shapley, uh, who was over in the UK at the time. Uh, at the time, Harold, uh, Harlow Shapley was the uh, Harvard College Observatory Director. Uh, she was introduced to him. I think Eddington may have been involved in this introduction, uh, but she met him and found out that uh, they were trying to develop a graduate program at Harvard. And in fact, she was uh, the second, I believe, of uh, one of the newly, uh, of the students that had entered this newly developed graduate program in astronomy at Harvard. Uh, there was one other woman and, of course, a lot of men. But, uh, you know, interestingly enough, and I know Doug is probably aware of this, and Doug, if you want to pipe in, uh, there were a number of ladies working at Harvard in astronomy, not necessarily as teachers, professors, uh, but, uh, you know, conducting research and assisting research. And so there was somewhat of an environment that was available that was in existence. Uh, that might have helped a little bit, although there were significant barriers uh, to Cecilia's continued education and her work as an astronomer. Doug, any comments you want to make? Yeah, the women that came out of that, uh, they were a little bit before uh, this woman. Yes. Um, but that they set up all the precedent for everything that happened afterward with women in at Harvard. That was Com uh, the term that was used was Pickering's harem. Pickering had a number of women that went on to become renowned astronomers in their own right. He had they were working for him as assistants in various yeah. programs. You had women like Henry Ann Levitt and a whole bunch yeah. of other very well known women came out of that group. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Yeah, and that was mentioned. You're right. They were they did precede. Uh, Cecilia's arrival at Harvard. Uh, whether or not they laid a little groundwork, quite possibly, but the whole idea was that certain aspects of Harvard's environment, uh, uh, you know, try to not necessarily promote women, but surely, uh, you know, allow women uh, to participate equally, not necessarily as much as men. Uh, but later on, we'll find out that the president of Harvard was very much against certain aspects of uh, uh, women in academia and most assuredly in teaching positions. But anyhow, like I say, she did follow over to the US. <clears throat> in 1925, she earned the first PhD in astronomy for Radcliffe College. Not the first PhD for a woman, the first PhD uh, in astronomy uh, with respect to Harvard. So, you know, I'm gonna speak about a lot of things. There is no doubt that uh, Cecilia uh, was the first in a lot of things. Some as a woman, some as a woman, and some just, you know, as a person. Uh, one thing that we'll come to find out, uh, not only was she a prominent female astronomer, she was just a prominent astronomer, gender notwithstanding, or regardless 
agenda. And uh, when we talk about some of her work, I think that'll become evident, but uh, most assuredly, and she wasn't an activist. Uh, she wasn't real loud. She was certainly aware of some of these barriers, uh, some of the uh, you know uh, issues with respect to women in the sciences, women in astronomy, uh, women at Harvard, uh, uh, and as far as, you know, acceptance and uh, uh, notoriety or, uh, you know, an understanding uh, somewhat to uh, as far as any prominence with respect uh, to the discipline. Uh, her doctoral thesis, uh, Stellar Atmospheres, and this is uh, essentially one of the first areas of study uh, that uh, Cecilia Payne uh, worked on uh, dealing with stars, compositions, origins. Uh, variable stars, uh, high mass stars, population one, two stars, uh, trying to, you know, explain and try to understand uh, the origins of galaxies to understand the mechanisms uh, uh, that, uh, you know, drove uh, these objects. Uh, and so you can see there's a summary basically of some of her research and things that were included in her doctoral thesis. Uh, she studied the spectral classes of stars uh, correlating to temperatures, applied uh, Mechmad's uh, Saha's ionization theory. Uh, variation in, tele in st stellar absorption lines caused by differing amounts of ionization at various temperatures, not differing quality uh, quantities of elements. Uh, most assuredly, the thinking at the time prior to her doctoral thesis was pretty much the elements in stars uh, were the same as you might find on Earth and to a certain degree in the same uh, relative quantities, okay? Which was something that uh, basically her research and this doctoral thesis said was not true. In other words, yeah, there are a lot of those same other metals, but she, what she found was that helium and especially hydrogen were vastly more present in stars. And in fact, taking a look at hydrogen uh, by a factor of 1 million. Uh, so, basically what she was saying that hydrogen was the preeminent element uh, in stars and in fact in the universe, in the galaxy in the universe. Uh, this was not accepted thinking at the time. Accepted thinking at the time was that stars were composed in the same relative quantities uh, as elements were on the earth. So it's just a matter of earth was, you know, was to attain a temperature of, you know, the sun or any other star for that matter, we would find, you know, the similar spectral uh, indications. Well, that was, of course, not true. Anyhow, going more a little bit more about her doctoral dissertation, and you can see a picture of uh, Harlow Shapley, because like I say, he was very much responsible, or assist, I shouldn't say responsible, but assisted uh, Cecilia Payne in getting her career started. Uh, but anyhow, uh, like I say, her dissertation did contradict uh, the consensus at the time uh, that the sun and earth were compositional elements were similar. Uh, there was individuals, Henry Russell was a real well-known uh, uh, astronomer, I believe, from Princeton, uh, who basically, you know, uh, you know, didn't like her dissertation. She thought he, uh, you know, basically said it was spurious because it went against uh, the consensus at the time with respect to the elemental components being uh, relatively similar between the Earth and the Sun. However, Otto Strube, who at the time was the director of the Yerkes Observatory in Wisconsin, thought it was the most brilliant PhD thesis ever written in astronomy. Uh, we come to find out, and even Russell acquiesced as he conducted more research, uh, it wasn't necessarily that uh, he was against uh, Cecilia because she was a woman, but he did not agree with her conclusions. However, we find that just a few years later, uh, his research was able to confirm uh, her results. Uh, he did make reference to it, though, though uh, not in the sense that that she was the one that really uh, made this discovery. Uh, he was just basically confirming it. And what we've come to find out now, uh, the Milky Way for the most part is composed of, uh, as far as real, uh, real matter, 74% uh, hydrogen, 24% helium, uh, which were the same as her calculations that she obtained in 1925 or very similar uh, that were specified published in her thesis. Okay, so now she's done with school basically, uh, and she's she's still at Harvard. Uh, she's she does her postdoc. In fact, she like I say, she stays at Harvard the rest of her career. Uh, her postdoc studies focused on high luminosity and variable stars uh, to better understand the structure of our own galaxy. Um, 
in some of her research, you know, she had a number of assistants. She certainly did not do this by herself. Uh, but I think uh, in the case of her doctoral thesis, there were, no, I won't say that because I don't know for sure, but there were a couple of different studies she did. One, it did involve one, actually one and a quarter million uh, uh, images were actually uh, compiled the research. And there was another two million further work. Uh, so there were a lot of glass plates. I don't know where all these are now, but uh, not that I'm saying that there were two, you know, three, three and a quarter million plates, uh, but they certainly looked at a number of observations. I think some of them could have been included uh, in the same element. And then one of her first uh, publications uh, after her thesis was uh, The Stars of High Luminosity. Uh, Cecilia remained active in astronomy through her entire life. And here again, like I say, it was at Harvard. Initially, following her PhD, uh, when she was still at Harvard, she was basically could only be assigned to low paid research. And she did some teaching. She did teach some basic astronomy classes. However, as we'll find uh, for the most part, you know, uh, Harvard did not list these uh, classes that she taught in their catalog. Uh, so there was very little recognition. That was the word I was looking for before. Uh, for the most part, and this was something that basically followed until late in her life. Uh, there was very little recognition for the work she did. Uh, primarily because she was a woman. Uh, if uh, you know her work had been recognized similarly to her male colleagues, uh, I think a lot more people would have heard the name, especially those outside the discipline, and certainly been familiar because she was on the same stature uh, with respect to people like you know like Shapley, like Eddington, maybe not quite as Eddington, but still should have been mentioned in the same breath. Uh, I think, I think you know if you want to look at a comprehensive list. Uh, taking a look at astronomers in the 20th century, uh, very easily, she was, you know, in the top 20, very possibly in the top 10, with respect to the work she did and the amount of work she did. Uh, anyhow, as I, you know, coming back to Shapley, he served as her champion for a long time at Harvard. Uh, he assisted her in her early academic career, too. Uh, 1938 was able to help her secure uh, an endowed position. Uh, wasn't quite a full professorship. That didn't come till later. Uh, but she was given a title. Phillips Astronomer, obviously, uh, a person by the name of Phillips endowed the position uh, and later become Phillips Professor of Astronomy. And this was much later. You can see there's almost a 20-year gap here. Uh, she was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 43. Uh, like I say, her courses were not recorded in Harvard until the catalog in 1945. Uh, one of her strongest opponents, and of course, this is what created, uh, and, and I don't want to say difficulties, but Matt, rather that this was probably the single, one of the single individuals uh, responsible for her not receiving uh, the recognition that she deserved. Uh, at the time, the Harvard president, uh, Abbott Lawrence Lowell, uh, declared uh, while he was there, and obviously he was probably gone by 58, that there would never be a female professor, full professor at Harvard University. And so, you know, he was, he was, he was one of these barriers uh, preventing her from, you know, uh, obtaining the recognition, uh, being given the titles that she probably should have been since she was doing the work, eminently qualified to do, uh, but uh, he was one of those barriers. Uh, in fact, it was, you know, she was one of the first women promoted to full professor with Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences in 56, so I suspect at that point, uh, Lowell was probably gone. Interestingly enough, today in Harvard, I don't know what building it is, there's a nice picture of uh, Abbott Lawrence Lowell on one of the walls in a very prominent position. And within about 10 feet is now uh, uh, Cecilia Payne uh, Kaboshkin's picture, uh, which is you know sort of, a, I don't know, poetic justice, I guess is the best, best way to look at it, uh, being displayed so far from someone uh, who did not, you know, was not willing to recognize her. I don't think he necessarily had anything against her personally, but as far as the acceptance of women into this particular discipline uh, was, you know, a bit way too old school or a fuddy-duddy uh, probably is the best way to describe it. Because I was interested in where that timeline wound up. Abbott Lowell died in 1943. Oh, he died? Okay, so this was much before then. Thank you. 
So obviously he'd been gone for a while, but it still took her a while before she obtained uh, some of these positions. Thank you, Connor. Uh, later, she was appointed to the chair of the Department of Astronomy. Now, in this case, she was the first woman to lead a department. I suspect this was at Harvard uh, at that time. So, you know, certainly there was some groundbreaking work she did. And certainly she is, you know, she's been a role model. She's laid, uh, uh, broken some ground or broken the glass ceiling, I guess, if you want to take a more uh, contemporary uh, uh, metaphor uh, for other women uh, to you know, move into the discipline uh, more so than they had in the past. Uh, she retired from active teaching in 66 and was appointed a professor, professor emeriti of Harvard University. However, she continued her research on staff at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, which is in the grounds of Harvard. And I know that they do, I don't know if she worked in any of the other satellite facilities, I know that they do have satellite facilities. At that time, they may have been somewhat limited, uh, but for instance, a number of the, uh, some of the infrastructure, some of the uh, telescopes up on, uh, I think it's Mount Wrightson. Mount Hopkins. Uh, Whipple, Mount Hopkins, thank you. Uh, Mount Hopkins, the Whipple Observatory, that's a Smithsonian uh, astrophysical uh, part of that system uh, related to both the Smithsonian and Harvard. And she continued to edit journals and books published by Harvard for 10 years. She was probably responsible. I think there were about four or five textbooks uh, or books that she wrote on astronomy. Uh, I, th I suspect a lot of these were used in some basic courses because they certainly looked like it. And uh, both individually and working with others, particularly her husband, co-author, uh, she authored uh, in excess of, I think, 350 uh, papers that were published uh, in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, she edited and published The Evolution of Stars and Galaxies, the lectures of Walter Bodd. Uh, this was an eminent uh, European astronomer back in the, oh, I'm going to think, suspect probably the 20s, 30s, and maybe 40s. Uh, interesting enough, you know, there was, you know, she did make trips. She did uh, uh, participate in some of these international conferences. Uh, I don't know if I have any pictures of that. I don't think I included any. Uh, but there was one that was, in fact, conducted in 1939. Uh, it was an interesting picture because it had, so it was about a collection of about a dozen astronomers. Bod was certainly there. I think, I can't remember if Eddington was there. Her and her husband were there. She was the only female. Uh, but this was in a conference on NOVA that was NOVA that was conducted, I think, in Austria in 1939. So getting very close to the time when uh, most of the academics, uh, you know, fled or uh, went into hiding around Europe. Um, getting to some, some of the things that she accomplished in her life. I'm not going to read through these. You can look at these. I'll, I'll just leave this up for a while. Uh, but certainly she was a member of uh, quite a few uh, societies and academies associated with her work. Uh, quite a few awards, a uh, few objects. Astro she has an asteroid named after her uh, specifically. Uh, honorary degrees from about half a dozen other institutions. But you can see, uh, of course, you know, some of the more important ones, elected member of the Royal Astro Astronomical Society in Cambridge, 1923. Uh, that was very significant. She was elected as a student, I believe. Uh, so that was, uh, you know, it wasn't only just an important step for a woman, but an important step for anybody, uh, man or women. There weren't too many that were uh, elected uh, that early in their careers or their lifetimes. Um, as far as a member of the American uh, Philosophical Society in 1936, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which was probably one of the preeminent professional academic organizations uh, with respect to the sciences in the United States. Uh, but uh, you can see, even it's kind of interesting, Henry uh, Norris Russell, like I say, who, you know, initially disagreed with her dissertation, uh, you know, as far as lectureship of uh, the American Astronomical Society, this is a specific award uh, that was named uh, uh, in his honor. Uh, but anyhow, then moving on, um, a couple of things. Of course, she plays the trail at Harvard U Observatory for more women, Harvard, Harvard University and Harvard Observatory. Uh, they are associated, but uh, quite different. Uh, of course, most of the folks uh, that conduct research at the observatory may not necessarily teach. I just, like I said, she stopped teaching pretty much in 66 and spent the last 13 years of her life, which she continued to do research, uh, continued to edit and write. Uh, she was a role model for many women, not just in astronomy, but science. And one in particular I found kind of interesting 
Uh, Joan Feynman. I don't know if any of you recognize the last name, but yes, she was Feynman. the younger sister. <laughs> What's that? Feynman Lectures. Yes, she was. She was the younger sister of Richard Feynman. Uh, I don't know, Doug. You can tell me. I would think probably you know, especially last century, but even over all history, top five physicist. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, he was. You know, you look at Einstein, Feynman. Um, Hawking and maybe one or two others. These were these were the people that you know talked a lot, wrote a lot, uh, you know, did a lot of work in physics. But uh, and I'm trying. She was an astrophysicist and space physicist herself. Uh, so if I just found that kind of interesting, but certainly there are quite a number of notable. Uh, she you know notable students she had, uh, notables that followed her footsteps both at Harvard and at and at the observatory, and probably to a certain extent. Uh, and I think uh, with respect to Joan, she was reading, I think, a textbook uh, that had a lot of uh, Cecilia's work in there. And that's what, you know, she realized that if this lady could do this and, you know, and, you know contribute, make this much of a contribution, why can't I? And I think that's uh, one of the things when I talk about being a role model. Uh, that she showed for other women that moved into the discipline over time, especially after World War II into the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, a couple of key um, quotes I wanted to uh, bring to mind. Uh, basically, this har harkens back a little bit to why she got interested in science when she was young, prior to her, uh, to her uh, university educations. Um, and, you know, why science was important to it, what she hoped to get out of it, what she uh, thought the value was. And then moving on to the next one, this is probably the one uh, that is most identified with her. And it wasn't, like I say, you know, Cecilia wasn't outspoken. She wasn't an activist. Uh, like I say, she was certainly aware of what was going on around in her environment, uh, but pretty, pretty much she just plowed on through. She was, you know, she was a mom to three children. Uh, they had an active family life, uh, attended church when, you know, when they had their kids. Uh, pretty much uh, they've been identified as a bit of a chaotic family, but I don't, you know, I'm not sure where that came from, but pretty much just a normal family. But anyhow, one of the things, and this was later in life, and I can't remember exactly, I suspect this was, uh, this quote came from the 60s or 70s, but young people, especially young women, I would often ask her for advice. And here it is, Ballot Quantum. I always like the lad for as much as it is worth. Uh, do not undertake a scientific career in quest of fame or money. And, you know, she understood that more than anybody else, I think. There are easier and better, better ways to reach them. Undertake it if, undertake it only if nothing else will satisfy you. For nothing else is probably what you will receive. No expectations. Your reward, your reward will be the widening of the horizon as you climb. And if you achieve that reward, you'll be asked no other. And I think, you know, this is pretty much, uh, pretty much encapsulates what guided her through her life, uh, both in her education, uh, in her research, uh, in her teaching, in her studies, in her writings, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, like I say, uh, I found her to be a most interesting individual. Uh, there isn't. There actually is an autobiography that she published years ago. I was not able to get a hold of it. I couldn't get it quick enough. And I'm sure it would be a fascinating read uh, uh, to understand a little bit more. But uh, this is just a, a brief look uh, at her career. Uh, these are the references that I used. Uh, one of them is obituary. Actually, it was written by uh, Mr. Ginnerich uh, and a couple of other, of course, the usual Wikipedia, but a couple of other sources, a couple of other magazine stories that came out uh, mostly in uh, this millennia uh, talking about her career. So it was quite interesting. And thank you for your attention. Are there any questions or comments, please? Well done, Pete. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, sir. Like I say, she was a fascinating individual. I really enjoyed uh, doing the research and digging a little bit further and going into, you know, other than just covering her work, trying to understand her life. And of course, it's always fascinating, you know, when you got someone that's a little bit more modern, there's, there's plenty of information out there. And with that, Doug, whenever you're ready. Once again, thanks, Pete. Thank you.
Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm I'm gonna I I picked this topic out of interest. Uh, I was curious about this, and I learned a great deal in doing this research that I hadn't known before. Um, and I this is a really cool topic, I think, or anyway, to me it was. So I'm going to talk about volcanism in the solar system. Um, we know, I mean, volcanism is very common in the solar system. We know it exists on numerous planets and numerous satellites of the planets. Um, we know it exists or did exist on Mars, Earth, Mercury, Venus. We, we know it was there. We know there was volcanoes on the moon. We also know there's different kinds of volcanoes on Io, Europa, Triton, and, and other moons in the solar system. And so it's a very common occurrence. Um, we also know that there's volcanic activity is active on a number of the inner planets and on some of the outer planet satellites. Um, volcanism played a very important role in the evolution of the planets, as it turns out. Um, had a lot to do with how the planets became what they are today. Um, likewise for the satellites and as a result of that you could also say that volcanism played an important role in whether you got life on a planet or not um, as we'll see as we go through it um, some typical images of volcanoes that is a volcano on the earth down in the left corner it's in tonga uh, there's the olympus mons volcano on mars and there are some volcanic plumes um, on Saturn's moon, Enceladus. Um, so I'm going to spend a little time on geology, just a quick refresher, because you need to understand this just a little bit in order to get through this. Um, for, for, there be, for there to be volcanic activity, you need three things. You need some kind of an energy source to drive what did I spell that? Acidity? Sorry, activity. My fault. You need a reservoir of some warm liquid. And I put quotes around it because we'll find out later it isn't necessarily warm. Um, and that warm liquid has to be able to reach the surface of the planet or moon. So there has to be a path somehow for it to get there. On the Earth, it, we all we know volcanoes really well on the Earth. The energy source in the Earth is the leftover heat from when the Earth was formed four billion years ago is still there in the core. Plus, you've got the radioactive decay of a lot of heavy elements in the Earth's core producing heat. So that's your energy source that's, that is driving this whole process. Um, that energy source is what keeps the mantle molten so that's your warm liquid is the magma in the mantle and on earth we have plate tectonics which provides lots of pathways for the magma to get to the surface through the volcanoes along the plate boundaries and this map shows you exactly what i'm talking about here um, the red dots are locations of volcanoes and the gray lines are the tectonic plate boundaries on the Earth. And as you can see, most of the volcanoes, not all of them, most of them are located along those plate boundaries because that provides convenient pathways for magma to reach the surface. But, as I just said, not all of the volcanoes are located along these plate boundaries. You'll see some oddball volcanoes that appear to be located right in the middle of plates. Uh, the obvious example is the Hawaiian Islands, right out there in the middle of the Pacific Ocean plate. Um, those are what's called hotspot volcanoes. Um, as it turns out, those type of volcanoes are very important because that's what we see throughout the solar system. 
Um, a quick review for those of you who don't understand hotspot volcanoes. What a hotspot volcano is on Earth is you have a, a, a spot, a hot spot in between the, if you look at this top diagram up here, you have a hot spot right there where the magma is a little bit closer to the crust than it normally would be. And so it punches through the crust and forms a volcano. But because of plate tectonics, the crust is moving, whereas this hot spot is staying stationary. So this hot spot over time creates a whole chain of volcanoes that move off in the direction that the plate is moving. Okay. And so that's how you get the Hawaiian Islands. It's a chain of volcanoes. If you look at the picture on the right, you can see this is a map of the ocean bottom. And there's a whole chain of volcanoes running from Hawaii off to the west-northwest. And then there's a sharp turn, and then it moves up to the north. And that that's because the Pacific Plate right now is moving generally off to the west northwest towards japan and 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 that part of uh russia right there to, uh a long time ago the Pacific plate was moving almost due north so that accounts for that change in direction of that chain of islands but that chain goes right up to the aleutian trench there which is where the pacific plate is being pushed underneath the other tectonic plates up there to the north. And that's called a subduction zone, which is also very important in our discussion. OK, so that's enough of your basic geology. Um, so now just a review on something else, how all the planets form. Well, certainly all of the inner solar system planets, meaning Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, they all basically form the same way. Um, and they're all basically made of the same material. Um, they all went through the same evolutionary states. Um, they all had, they all went through around 4 billion years ago, there was a, a period called the late heavy bombardment. All four of the planets were heavily bombarded by meteorites and asteroids at that time. They all had lots of volcanic activity going on at that time. And three of the four planets had very thick atmospheres and had water on the surface and were all very similar. Okay. And then we always ask, well, why is it different today? Um, why are the planets so different today? Why is Venus the way it is? Why is Mars the way it is? And why is Earth the way it is? As it turns out, we can answer those questions. We really didn't know what Mars looked like until 1971. Uh, we had sent spacecraft to Mars before that, but they really hadn't gotten a good look at it. It wasn't until Mariner 9 got to Mars in 1971 that I, we got our first good look at Mars. And in fact, when Mariner 9 got there at first, it saw almost nothing because Mars was in the middle of one of those global sandstorms that Mars gets. Um, and all, Mar all Mariner 9 saw were these four dark spots sticking up through the top of the sandstorm. Uh, that picture on the right is one of Mariner 9's very first images. And you can see three of those dark spots there. Well, as it turns out those dark spots are the largest volcanoes in the solar system. Um, we now know that Mars has a number of volcanoes on its surface. And we also know that its surface was once very similar to Earth. It had oceans, it had weather. And a lot of the early evidence of its early history has been erased by the weather, just like on Earth. Um, it still has some craters from heavy bombardment and other activity, but most of the early history has been erased. Um, 
but we want to look at the volcanoes very carefully. Um, so the map on the bottom there shows the location of all of what they call the major volcanoes. Um, there are also a large number of smaller volcanoes that are not marked on that map. Um, the four volcanoes on the left, like I said, those were the ones that were sticking up through the through the dust cloud, through the dust storm on Mars, um, and they are huge. Those four volcanoes are actually the largest volcanoes in the solar system, and Olympus Mons is the largest of those four. Um, to give you some idea of how big Olympus Mons, go down to the bottom and there's a picture in the middle where it overlays Olympus Mons volcano on France. It's almost as big as the entire nation of France. And in that picture up on the top right, you, you get an idea of how tall it is compared to the volcanoes and mountains on Earth. Um, as a matter of fact, the four volcanoes there in that one region are so massive they expelled so much material in their volcanic you know, domes and their shield volcanoes and everything that it caused the tilt, the axial axis rotation tilt by to change by almost 20 degrees over the history. Just it's it's like taking a ball that's very well balanced and putting a weight in one spot. It's not balanced anymore and it'll It'll start wobbling and you'll get a big change in the axis of rotation. And that's what happened there. Um, also, the weight of all that mass was literally so heavy um, that it cracked the crust. And that's the what caused the uh, Great Rift, the Valles Marineris Rift, to open up. That's a crack from the crust literally cracking under the weight. Um, so that, that was... An interesting fact I didn't know. Yeah, I had thought it was one of those, one of the main theories proposing uh, the Valles Marineris was a, a rapid flood earlier in the No, it certainly was enlarged by flooding and, um, you know, wind erosion and so forth has made it larger, but it was actually formed as, as, as a rift, as a, as a crack in the crust by the weight of that plateau here, I'm going to go back. This whole plateau here, okay, around these volcanoes, is all of the material that came out of the volcanoes forms this plateau right here. And it has so much weight on the crust that the crust cracked. And you see where Valley, right there, is where the crust cracked from the weight. Um, there, was a, there was a question from Mike Tozer about asking if we know if Mars had plate tectonics at any period in its history. I do not know that one off the top of my head. Keep going. I'm going to answer that question. Okay. We're going to talk about that. That's going to turn out to come into play here. Uh, so, so one of the questions you ask is, why, why are the volcanoes so large on Mars, okay, compared to the mountains and volcanoes on Earth? Okay, well, I mean, one reason, obviously, the gravity is only one third on Mars. So mountains and volcanoes could get three times, in theory, as tall as they are on Earth before they would not be able to support themselves structurally. But that's only part of the explanation. Um, the, the real reason why the volcanoes are so big is because Mars does not have plate tectonics. So you have these hotspot volcanoes sitting in the same spot. The crust is not moving. So they just keep erupting in the same spot over and over and over again. So instead of forming a chain of volcanoes like Hawaii, you just keep building the same volcanic mountain bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's how the volcanoes got so huge. They're just sitting there erupting over and over again and getting larger and larger and larger. Um, and nothing to stop them except when they finally get too big that they can't support themselves, which obviously hasn't happened. Olympus Mons is still 
really huge. Um, the bottom, the bottom left image is Olympus Mons. The bottom right image is, is an artist conception of what Olympus Mons would look like if it was erupting. Um, so we currently believe that Mars is today a geologically dead planet, meaning that there's no um, volcanic activity on it today that we're aware of or any other things like no tectonic activity or anything like that. No, no, it's, we think it's geologically dead. Now Mars at one time we know had a thick atmosphere. There was water, there was weather, probably rain. It had lots of active volcanoes. Um, but what we think happened in the case of Mars, um, Mars is pretty bit smaller than the Earth. Its um, volume is about 15% of Earth's volume, and its surface area is about 28% of the Earth's surface area. Now, the rate at which a planet cools down, so to speak, is very dependent on the ratio of the surface area to the volume. So in the case of Mars, it has a higher ratio of surface area to volume than the Earth does. So as it turns out, it, it cooled down a lot faster than the Earth. And as it cooled, it will cool from the outside in. That's the way it cools, because you've still got heat at the center of the planet, but as it cools, the, the rock solidifies from the outside going in, you might say. So we think that what happened in the case of Mars is the crust grew thick very early. And as a result, you never had tectonic plate formation because the crust was too thick to break up the way the Earth's crust broke up. Um, Mars probably had a core like this, very similar to the Earth's core, but and it probably had a magnetic field. Um, but as it lost its heat, the core probably solidified. And as when the core solidifies, you don't have the, the liquid molten rock spinning and so you're not producing a magnetic field anymore so the magnetic field probably disappeared um, as a result of the magnetic field disappearing there was nothing to protect the atmosphere and so what atmosphere it had would have been eventually eroded away by the solar wind and when the atmosphere goes away so does all your surface water and you end up with the dead planet that we see today one thing I do want to add is that although Mars is not really geologically active, uh, with the InSight lander from a couple years ago, there are still Mars quakes yes. of some types. Um, I can't remember what, if um, they pinned down the origin of those or if it's just left over shifting in the in the planet. Well, the, the, there's, there's, there's a lot no, of potential still, reasons for that. But. There's still, uh, you know, the... Some of the theories today about it is that there's still some internal heat, though not enough to drive any kind of volcanic activity or any kind of tectonic activity. Mars is still not completely solid all the way through to its core, so it's still shrinking. As it shrinks, you're going to get Mars quakes, you want to call them that, because the, the crust will have to crack and, and wrinkle and, and stuff like that will still happen. <clears throat> so it's not completely dead in that sense. Now, we'll, we'll know a lot more when we get more seismometers on it and can do a better job of understanding its internal structure. But that's, that's the current understanding is that it's still a little bit active in the core is still, there's still something in the core that's cooling off. It's still shrinking a little bit and so on. Let's take a look at Venus. Now Venus is the opposite extreme of Mars. So now here's a planet that's roughly the same size as the earth, formed exactly the same way the earth did made of the same material, had a very similar early history. Um, it probably had a nice atmosphere at one time. We're pretty sure there was water on its surface and, you know, that it was very much 
At one time, you could have thought of it as the twin of the Earth. Uh, it certainly isn't that today. Um, it's a very unpleasant place today. Um, and again, let's take a look at the volcanic activity for hints, and we'll learn a lot here. This I didn't know. As it turns out, Venus has more volcanoes on its surface than any other body in the solar system. There are over 85,000 volcanoes on its surface. Um, the map on the bottom shows you where they're located. Basically, they're located everywhere. Um, no pattern. They're just all over the place. Um, <clears throat> and again, like Mars, no plate tectonics. So again, all of these volcanoes would be considered hotspot volcanoes. Now, one difference is the volcanoes on Venus are still active. Um, we have found evidence of active volcanic activity on Venus. These are two images taken by the Magellan spacecraft when it was orbiting Venus back in 1991. They're taken eight months apart. And this area that's in this image is uh, right on the top of one of the volcanoes. It's in the caldera region of one of the large volcanoes on Venus. And they're taken from slightly different angles and they're radar images. They're not regular camera images, but radar images was the only thing they could use to penetrate the, the clouds in the atmosphere. Um, but what you see here is this vent uh, is changed shape dramatically between this time and this time. And this looks to be a fresh lava flow right here that you don't see in this image. Okay, so it looks like something's happening. Um, so we, we believe, we're pretty sure that there's still active volcanoes on Venus. Um, and that's not really a surprise because Venus is about the same size as the Earth. We would expect that it would not be dead like Mars. It hasn't cooled down. It should be retaining uh, roughly the same amount of internal heat as the Earth because it should have cooled down at approximately the same rate. Um, so we think it has a liquid mantle and a crust and has a similar structure internally as the Earth does. So we're not surprised if there's active volcanoes on Venus. Um, but the one thing that we're always asked then is, well, why does Venus not have plate tectonics? Um, we're not totally sure. Um, the one theory that we do have that may answer that is that Venus has a very slow rotation period on the order of, uh, well, I think it's what, like 180 days or something for it to do one rotation on its axis. As a result of that, if it has a liquid mantle, which we believe it does, it's not spinning very fast. Like the Earth is doing a complete spin in 24 hours. So perhaps because it's spinning so slow, it's not producing a magnetic field, okay? Um, and and so that that may also account for why it doesn't have plate tectonics, because the mantle is the mantle fluid is spinning so slow, it's not really doing it's not really pushing the crust around like the Earth does. You've got the mantle spinning every twenty four hours that that the crust is having to keep up with that motion, and so it cracks and things. And so we're not seeing it on Venus. And and because it has slow, such a slow rotation period, the crust probably got real thick um, because it didn't fracture immediately. And, and so you don't have this, you don't have the plate tectonics. Um, one, one other potential reason is we have a moon and Venus does not. Uh, that, that, yes, that's true too. That's true. We do get tidal forces on Earth that you don't get on Venus. That's true. That, you, that's also, true. you also have the impactor that would have formed the moon that may have, I'm not quite sure that what could, some theories that, that contributed to There's a lot of theories. There's, 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 there's many things. Yeah, uh, and, and we don't have a complete understanding of that. Um, there is some evidence that Venus had plate tectonics at some point in the past. 
um, by looking at some of the structures on the surface. There's also some evidence that there is actually a certain amount of plate tectonic activity today, but it's very different than what you see on Earth. Venus may have, instead of really large plates that cover whole continents and like the Pacific Ocean plate, like they have on Earth, Venus may have a lot of very tiny plates and they just jostle around, but the plates are so small that they don't, they don't, there's no subduction activity where there's no thrust activity where one plate gets pushed over another plate. They just kind of jostle around and bump into each other, you know, and there's no, there's no uh, subduction or, you know, that kind of activity going on. Kind of like having a bunch of ice cubes on the top of a, a bowl of water and, and, and they just move around and bump into each other, but they don't climb over each other or anything like that. In the, perhaps because the plates are too thick and they're too small an area and for whatever reason. But there's some there's some evidence to support that that activity type of activity may be happening. Um, but one thing they do know is this lack of tectonic te bleh, lack of tectonic activity on Venus. It goes a long way towards explaining how the atmosphere of Venus got to be what it is today. Volcanoes on Earth and Venus and Mars for that matter, um, a couple of the major components that come out of volcanoes, carbon dioxide and various sulfur compounds are a lot of the major things that come out of Venus. On the Earth, that stuff gets thrown into the atmosphere, okay, just like it does on Venus. Um, and and as you all know, CO2 is a great greenhouse gas. Okay. But on Earth, okay, we have what's called the carbon cycle. This carbon dioxide it gets into the atmosphere, but then gets pulled down to the ground in the rain, ends up in the ground, ends up in the oceans, and eventually all that stuff ends up in rocks at the bottom of the ocean and in the rocks of the continents into the tectonic plates and gets subducted back down into the earth, sort of recycled. We It takes billions of years or millions of years for that to happen, but we have that nice cycle where the stuff is getting recycled like that. Well, Venus doesn't have that activity to do it. No subduction like that is happening on Venus. As a result, those 85,000 volcanoes continue to pump that stuff into the atmosphere over and over and over again. And over a period of billions of years, you end up with the atmosphere that you see today because it's not getting recycled back down into the, into the, into the mantle. So it just keeps getting pumped up. You just keep building up the carbon dioxide compounds and the sulfur compounds up into the atmosphere until you end up with that thick carbon dioxide atmosphere that Venus has today with the sulfuric acid rain and all of that wonderful stuff that makes what we call the runaway greenhouse of Venus. So the, the lack of the tectonic activity was really important for Venus. Now, what about poor little old Mercury? I didn't talk much about Mercury. <laughs> um, Mercury also went through all the same evolution phases as the other planets, but Mercury, unlike the other three terrestrial planets, probably never had a thick atmosphere, probably never had any surface water, um, but it was hit with the heavy lake bombardment and, and it had volcanism. There's lots of evidence of volcanism on Mercury. But Mercury started out with a very bad early history. Um, early in the sun's history, uh, when the sun first turned on, it was probably much, much hotter than it is today. Uh, temperatures in the region of Mercury could have gotten as high as five to 6,000 degrees Kelvin on the surface of Mercury for a short period of time early in the solar system's history. Mercury was probably twice as massive as it is today. 
literally the sun probably vaporized half the mass, literally just vaporized and evaporated away. And in the case of Mercury, this would have been all the light stuff on the surface because Mercury, just like the other planets, would have been differentiated with a heavy core and the lighter elements closer to the surface. So in the case of Mercury, all the light stuff burned away, leaving just the heavy core and the heavy what's left of the mantle behind, which is why Mercury has such a high density. It's it's the most dense planet outside of the Earth, and it's got a very uh, heavy internal structure that we're aware of. No atmosphere, no nothing, because all that would have, it never had a chance to form in the case of Mercury. Um, when the sun finally stabilized at a much cooler state, Mercury was already basically a dead planet with nothing left but what you see today. Um, like I said, there is plenty of activity, plenty of evidence for Mercury's volcanism. Um, um, in fact, there's some evidence to support that there's been recent volcanism. Um, not a lot, but there's probably some. Uh, and we think that's due to the fact that Mercury is actually undergoing the phenomenon that we call tidal heating. It's so close to the sun, and it's in a very eccentric orbit, uh, that it, it, has, it undergoes fairly large tidal bulges. Um, at least five times larger than the Earth's tidal bulges. And that may be large enough to produce the occasional volcanic activity from the internal heating from the tidal, from the tidal effects. Um, like I said, there's plenty of evidence to support volcanism in the past. Um, that image on the left, that's a caldera that collapsed. We can see that there's two pits there that show this is a collapsed Cadero pit. Here's another one here. <laughs> Here's a crater that's filled with basalt that um, shows fractures from when the basalt cools, it contracts. And so you get these cracks on the surface. We see this on the moon a lot. And then there's lava tubes, collapsed lava tubes. This is an image from the moon, and this is an image from Mercury, and these are collapsed lava tubes. So we know Mercury had volcanoes in the past, and like I said, there's a certain amount of evidence that suggests there's still something going on today. Um, volcanism is not a surprise in the inner solar system. We expected to, to see it or evidence of it on all of the inner planets. But when we, when we moved out to the giant planets, we didn't expect to see volcanism out there. Um, the gas giants certainly don't have volcanism. And we expected all of the moons out there to be dead like our moon, kind of just dead cratered rocks. Um, Voyager got to, Voyager 1 got to Jupiter in 1979. Now, Voyager was not the first spacecraft to fly by Jupiter. Um, Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11 had flown by Jupiter in 1973 and 1974, but they really didn't do any detailed imaging of the moons, so we, we didn't really notice anything from the Pioneer images. We weren't expecting to see anything in the Voyager images, so we actually didn't originally programmed Voyager to take a whole lot of detailed images of any of the moons. But on March 9th in 1979, we were they were looking at images that had been taken for the purposes of navigating the spacecraft. And they got this image of Io that you see down in the left. And it's like, OK. There's something they hadn't seen before, like, what is this? And what is that? Um, turns out you're looking at volcanoes on Isle. Um, as a result of that image, they immediately reprogrammed Voyager's 
imaging sequence and actually changed its flight path a little bit to take a whole lot of close-up images of the various moons. And they reprogrammed Voyager 2 also to change its schedule <coughs> to look at the moons. As it turns out, Io is the most active, volcanically active body in the solar system. At any one time, there are 400 volcanoes erupting on Io at any particular time. The entire surface of the, of the moon has been resurfaced with, with volcanic plume material. Um, so there's almost no impact craters. They're, they're completely gone. The whole surface has been covered over many times. Um, the plume material is mostly sulfur stuff, and that's what leads to all of the interesting colors, because sulfur, um, when it solidifies, it depends on what color, what temperature it was melted at, to, that has a lot to do with what color it takes on after it cools. So you get all these interesting yellows and reds and oranges on Io. Um, so that's, that's why Io was once described as pizza. Um, the current theory is that Io has a differentiated structure with the heavier elements down deep and the lighter elements like sulfur and other things close to the surface. So that's what you see in the coming out of the volcanoes all the time. Um, picture on the left here, on the bottom left, are two images that were taken by the Juno spacecraft using thermal cameras showing you just, there's all the volcanoes erupting on two different dates. The one on the left is December, 2022, and the one on the right is March, 2023. Just, they're all over the place. Um, here's an image from Voyager, the one on the right, showing several volcanic plumes. The volcanic plumes are these ring-like structures like this with these areas of white coming out. These are volcanic plumes spreading out and then falling back down to the surface. There's a couple of them you can see here. And then this black thing here is a volcanic lake. That's molten sulfur. It turns black when you melt it. So that's what we're seeing on Io. Now, obviously, in the case of Io, Io is very small. Um, so Io's activity can't be um, driven by the same stuff that drives the volcanism on the inner planet. So it, it can't be radioactive decay and um, any of the other mechanisms. Uh, that it can't be leftover heat from the formation because it's so small, it should be completely solid. Um, but something's driving it. And the answer that came up immediately was tidal heating. Um, tidal heating was not new, because you remember we talked about that for Mercury, but the level of activity was a bit of a surprise. Io's not in a circular orbit around Jupiter. Um, it would be if it was alone, but it's not alone. Um, it's in an elliptical orbit. And the reason it's still in an elliptical orbit is because it's got a resonance with the other moons. It's got a resonance with Europa and Ganymede. And as a result, those resonance periods always pulling on Io in the same direction at the same point in its orbit keep Io in an elliptical orbit. Um, so Io will never get into a circular orbit. As a result of it being in an elliptical orbit, it experiences a different amount of gravity from Jupiter as it moves in and out in its elliptical orbit. And Io is so close to Jupiter, and Jupiter is so massive, that the tidal forces on Io are 20,000 times stronger than the tidal forces that Earth experiences due to the moon. And as a result of that, there's a vertical tidal bulge in Io. The difference between when it's at closest approach to Jupiter and when it's at its farthest approach to Jupiter the tidal bulge is as much as 100 meters that's raised in the crust. So Io is getting stretched over and over again every time it goes in its orbit. 
like that picture down below shows it's getting stretched and yanked and pulled and that creates a tremendous amount of heat on the inside of idol which is what keeps it molten and what keeps driving the volcanic activity and then the last kind of volcanism that we find in the solar system is another new one that we really weren't sure that, that we we didn't find it until we went out and looked. Um, it's now called cryovolcanism. Uh, and that, the, the cryo means that the lava that's involved here that's being thrown out of the volcanoes is not hot. In fact, it's cold. Um, so here we're not talking about the same kind of volcanism. This is different. In normal volcanism, like what you see on the inner planets, and on Io, for that matter, the lava that's being thrown out of that's that's driving the volcano is less dense than the crust that it has to break through. And just from buoyant forces, because it's less dense, it wants to rise. It wants to go through the crust and get to the top. Okay, it's less dense than the crust. In cryovolcanism, it's the other way around. The, the fluid, the lava, if you like, is more dense than the crust, okay? It's like water and ice. The water, the liquid, is more dense than the ice, so the ice floats. In cryovolcanism, we're talking about a situation where the, 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 the liquid that's going to come out of the volcano is more dense than the surface, okay? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, we're, it's not driven by buoyant forces. Um, again, Voyager got to the Jupiter and we looked at Europa and we saw the, this picture here without the blue. We just saw the, the, the moon. We noticed it's cracked and we've got that. And we figured out very quickly that it's probably made of water ice and there's probably a liquid ocean under there and, and so on. But then Galileo got there and discovered something interesting. Galileo discovered these plumes down here, these water plumes coming out of Isle around the outside down here at this at this south polar region. Um, and we had to figure out what was driving this activity. Okay, well, we think, again, it's the tidal forces, because, again, just like Isle, <clears throat> Sorry, Europa is in an elliptical orbit, and it's locked in that orbit because of the resonance it has with the other moons. So it's getting stretched and pulled, just like Io is. So we think that that's what's causing the internal heat that keeps the water liquid. Okay. Um, we also think that that stretching, that constant stretching and and from, from the tidal forces, it is what's cracking the crust. We believe that the cracks, the fractures that we see in the crust are caused by that same tidal stretching. And unlike the volcanoes of, of uh, the inner planets, what happens on, on Europa is as soon as a crack forms, that exposes the water underneath the ice to the vacuum of space. And it immediately shoots off into space as a vapor. It immediately boils at zero pressure. And that's why we're seeing these plumes down here. They're, they're dashing off into space until the water freezes and you get a new crust of ice, okay? And this is a continuous process because the moon is continuously getting stretched and, and flexing back and forth, causing new fractures all the time. So you get this constant venting of water vapor into space. Um, we see the same thing on Saturn's moon Enceladus. Uh, it's doing exactly the same process. Um, it's a frozen world with a liquid ocean under subsur under a subsurface water under a surface of ice. And again, it's really close to Saturn. It's getting it's getting yanked by the tidal forces, and it's cracking the ice and causing. Um, the water to escape into space, um, and that here's here's Enceladus, and 
here you can see the plumes shooting off into space from the water vapor. Now the oddball one, there always is an oddball one, is Triton, Neptune's moon Triton. Um, now Triton is a very is a different example of cryovolcanism. Um, Triton happens to be in almost a perfect circular orbit. Its eccentricity is really small down in the sixth decimal place, really small, like 0. 0.00000 something. Um, it does happen to be orbiting in retrograde motion. It's, it's actually orbiting in the opposite direction that Neptune is rotating on its axis. So that's called a retrograde orbit. But it's in almost, like I said, a perfect circular orbit. So tidal forces is not what's driving the activity we see on Triton. Um, now, just, you know, its orbit is decaying because it's in a retrograde orbit, and, and it will someday, in about three and a half billion years, pass inside Neptune's Broch limit and get torn apart and probably form a new ring around Neptune. That's a long way off. Um, Real quick, but, Doug. Yeah. For clarifying a term here, the Roche limit is a point in which a stable body in orbit around another body can still maintain its shape before disintegrating. It varies depending on the mass and some other factors of the two bodies. Yeah. Um, now, Triton is like a lot of moons around their major planets. It's tidally locked. So the same face of Triton always faces Neptune. That's like our moon. It's like most of the moons around Jupiter and Saturn. So, like I said, tidal heating is not the is not the driving force. However, what we do see on Triton is its axis of rotation. The moon's axis of rotation is tilted nearly forty degrees with respect to Neptune's orbital plane okay, around the sun. The result is that for half of Neptune's year. One hemisphere of Triton is getting a lot of sunlight. And the other hemisphere is not getting much. And then for the other half of the year, the other hemisphere gets a lot of sunlight. And the first hemisphere doesn't. Okay, so it, it gets a lot of sunlight in one region for a long time. And then the other side gets a lot of sunlight. Um, now, Triton, as it turns out, is mainly made of ices lots of nitrogen ice, methane ice, other frozen compounds. It's got a layer of dust on it just accumulated from being in space. We believe the crust is made up of various ices, which could include some water ice, um, nitrogen ice, methane ice, all kinds of things, accumulated dust, because it's really cold out there where Neptune is. So nitrogen freezes, methane freezes. And what we think is going on in the case of Triton is that as different parts of the moon are exposed to the direct sunlight, the crust begins to warm. Now, the crust is made up of various ices, and it's mixed with some dust. There's some dust on it. So the crust can take a little bit of heat without melting, just a little bit. But that heat penetrates down to the inner layers underneath the crust. And the ices underneath the crust the, the nitrogen and the methane and stuff melt and they vaporize. And eventually the pressure from that, when you when you take a liquid and turn it into a gas, it produces more pressure, blow through the crust, breach the crust, if you like, and you, you get these what's called cryovolcanic geysers. Um, as a result, Crichton has an atmosphere made up of nitrogen and other gases, but you, you get these Wonderful geysers. So here's Triton. And down in this image on the left, there's two, two of the geysers are identified right here. Here's one and here's another. And, and the, there is an atmosphere. There is actually a wind. The atmosphere tends to move from the cold side of the planet to the warm side of the planet. Or I'm sorry, it's the other way around. It moves from the warm side to the cold side. The wind is always blowing from the, from the side facing the sun to the side that's not facing the sun. Um, so you got this wind. So the plumes, when the geysers shoot the gas up into the air, you get these plumes that are blown downwind. And that's what you're seeing here. These are actually the shadows of the gas, of the plume gas. These are the shadows blowing downwind. And 
only one spacecraft has been to Neptune, that's Voyager 2. So, and it was just a flyby. So we only had, we, only, we have very limited imagery, but we were lucky. We got there and we caught one of the volcanic geysers in action. <laughs> These three images right here. The geyser is right about there and it's starting to blow up and it's starting to form a plume off, pushing off to the right. Here it is pushing more off to the right. And here it is pushing way off as it blows downwind. And those images were caught as Voyager went zooming by. So um, I think that's my last slide. Yeah. So, you know, in summary, what I found out is, gee, volcanic activity has a lot to do with how the planet eventually evolves. The type of activity that's going on and what's causing it lack of tectonic activity or whether you're lucky enough to live on a world that has subduction turns out subduction is important to controlling things like runaway greenhouse effect and it's like i never would have thought of that um but turns out that's important but i was interesting all these different types of volcanism i would like okay that's kind of cool so anyway okay thank you doug Thank you, Doug. Questions? Anything? There was one question from Galen, which I sort of answered, but I wanted to hear I want to hear your take on it as well, where he asked uh, that radioactives account for a lot of the heat inside Earth. Does Mars have I'll scroll real quick? Uh, does Mars not have the a radioactive material to the extent that Earth did, which would allow it to keep more flowing? My response to him. <laughs> Sorry about that. Was um, we aren't quite sure just because of the limited geological sampling that we've been able to do. All all we really currently have is generally theories. Okay, well, yeah, that's that's part of the, that's that's yeah, decent answer. But I mean, if you think about it, okay, Mars is a lot smaller than the Earth, so it would have had a much smaller amount of radioactive material probably in its core, and so it would have it would have decayed away faster, uh, quite a bit faster, because it was only about 15% of the, you know, like I said, it only had 15% of the volume of Earth. So let's assume it only had 15% of the radioactive material, because we're assuming that all the planets were more or less made of the same stuff and more or less formed the same way. Um, so it would have, that radioactive heat would have gone away a, a lot faster because there was just a lot less of it. There just wasn't that much radioactive material there compared to how much the Earth has. Does that more or less answer your question, I think? Who asked that? Galen. Okay. I did not believe it. Yeah. He responded, sure. So. so. And with that... Um, Nothing else left for the night on this. Uh, Tom, do you okay. have something? Yeah, Doug, I've, I've, I've got maybe a couple of questions for you. Go ahead. Um, Olympus Mons yeah. appears to have uh, these cliffs around the edge of it, or I think they call it an escarpment. Yeah. Any, any idea what the formation of that is? Erosion. Uh, er erosion, okay. Basically wind erosion. Okay, I figured maybe erosion or landslide, or the, really the reason I was asking is, is it some sort of uplift? So it sounds like it's it's just simple. It's it's a simple solution. Yeah, that's just erosion effect. Yeah. Okay, really silly question. On IO, we, we caught that plume. Yes. Uh, and and some of the things, you know, you don't have to go there. Um, some some of the things on IO are called lava lakes. Yes. Uh, I I presume it's so cold lava out lake. there that it's not really liquid lava on the surface, except yes, maybe. It is. Oh, okay. So this this well, these black areas, like this one right here, is a famous one. Uh -huh. I forget the name of it. Um, that is liquid sulfur. Okay. At a very high temperature, I mean, whatever temperature you need to liquefy sulfur. Okay, 
Cool. Yeah. So that would, Tom, that would Thanks. normally come from recent, since there's so much recurrent activity, there's constantly uh, liquid material on IO and it just pools. As okay. That, well, that's, so that's it's not, not, not going to yeah. be an instant eruption and then solidification. Because even I mean, if you take a look at this picture, there's a volcanic, <clears throat> this, this ring area is volcanic plume material settling back down to the surface. And this white stuff, these are the volcanic plumes moving out to the side. Okay. So there's, there's an active volcano like right here. Okay. On mm -hmm. this picture. And that's what's feeding this lava like. Okay, that's that's lava coming out of the side of the volcano is filling this depression up. And when Galileo and and Galileo and Juno have imaged that lake, and it changes shapes all the time because the volcano is active, then it shuts off, then it's active. So that lava lake is constantly changing, and this island is constantly changing shape. If you look at it today, it'll look different than it did when Voyager took that picture. Cool. Thanks. And hold a little bit for any more questions. Okay. <clears throat> and I will send you this presentation. Thank you, Doug. I already sent you mine, Connor, earlier. You did? Yes, I did. About. Three, four o'clock this afternoon. I do not have any emails from you. Well, let me check my email. Dun, dun. Did you send it on accident to the member planet address? Did I send it to what? The member planet address that they give me when I send out the I sent it to what? Well, whatever you mailed out the uh, invitations to. Oh, uh, that that's the member planet, which goes essentially nowhere. You had to... Uh, you don't get those? Don't you have no, them delivered you... to your regular? No. It's we disagree. well, I, I well, I will say no, that, that message re replying directly to that mail is weird and sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, I don't yeah. know. It's what's your email again? Um I I don't want to say it on a Zoom recording that's going to wind up on YouTube. Oh, okay. I I will Sorry. I will I will respond to your uh your thread. Okay. I I'll probably email you. have another address someplace. Sorry. <laughs> you do. It's just a message you there. Sublimation. Okay. I couldn't think of that word. My my other favorite word is laminar. That's oh, that's yeah. that's my absolute favorite word. It's, it sounds really cool and it also actually has a really cool physical effect. For, for those that don't know, laminar is essentially the word for how smooth a flow of liquid is, with the opposite of laminar being a turbulent flow. <laughs> oh, you're laughing. You're laughing at my uh, do not eat. No, I'm just I'm the conversation about sulfur. Yeah, my daily reminder, please do not try to eat IO. Okay. Um, with that, uh, we'll go ahead and end the recording. Okay.